All right, other relationships. When we talk about other relationships outside of marriage, we're talking about our social convoy, relationships that move through life with us. I mean, marriage is, if, if, you, if, if a person is married, that marital partner would be part of their social convoy, but it's a much steadier part of their social convoy. Let's talk about a part of the social convoy that has been there even before the spouse came out in the picture, and that would be siblings. Um, our siblings actually become more important to us with age on average. Now, I just watched an episode of The People's Court where this brother and sister have not talked to each other since the 1980s. So obviously it is not perfect for everyone. But on average, even if you have a period of time where you don't spend that much time with each other for various reasons, as you get into your um, later part of, of regular adulthood, siblings become more important. Closeness is more likely when, uh, you know, children are born and now you have an, a, a niece or a nephew. Um, when one of you gets divorced or widowed, that oftentimes will pull siblings together. The death of a family member, like a parent or, you know, a sibling or a cousin or somebody dies, that oftentimes will pull siblings back together. Um, one thing that can be hard is if the elderly parents are needing care. That can be divisive where maybe one sibling is carrying more of the load or thinks they're carrying more of the load. Um, sometimes there will be sort of implicit, okay, so you're the one who lives closer, so you're the one who will be checking on them and doing day-to-day -day things and, you know, I'll send money to help out and, and, you know, come down in the summers and visit or something like that. Um, and that might sound fine at first, but the person who's closer may start to feel bitter that they're the ones doing the day-to-day, -day, you know, more, um, less glamorous work or something, or maybe the one who's contributing money feels like, you know, they're contributing more, you know, than the other person is. And, and it can be, it can be a problem. Like it can make the siblings irritated with each other. Um, that's, that's a difficult position to be in where you're caring for parents for whoever the caregiver is in any way. What about our relationships with our children? Well, in adulthood, probably one of the most difficult parts of our relationship with our children is when they're in their adolescent period. Um, adolescents, as we've talked about, they're trying to figure out who they are. Um, you know, they have sort of this ambiguous relationship with their parents because they kind of want to be still children, but they also want to pretend like they want to throw off their duty to their family and stuff. It's, it's kind of a tough time. Um, you know, the parent is developing too. And I think a lot of times, you know, I don't know about you, but I know for me, when I was, when I was a kid, it seemed like my parents were always adults. I mean, I, ever since I've known them, they've been adults. And, uh, I really only remember them being middle-aged adults, right? Like when I was a little kid, I wasn't really aware enough to know what they were like or anything. And then by the time I got to be a teenager and I really opened my eyes and said, Hey, these are my parents. These are people. Um, they were already, you know, 35, 40 years old, something like that. And, uh, so they just seemed like, you know, parents, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, you know, being a self-absorbed adolescent, you know, oftentimes you put a lot of pressure on those people who made you. And, you know, meanwhile, they're going through their own things, right? They're adjusting, they're developing. There's a lot of, a, of development going on across adulthood. And they've got their marital issues and they've got their relationships with their siblings or their parents. And they've got all these things that they're juggling. And so this can cause a lot of stress in the household when you have, you know, adolescents in the household. There can be some jealousy you know, when I first started teaching lifespan development, uh, my my daughter was a year and a half old, and I thought, how are you ever going to be jealous of your baby? I mean, come on. And then when she was an adolescent and she had opportunities that I never got to have when I was her age, I was like, okay, I get, I see the jealousy. <laughs> I see some stuff. Like she's gotten to, she got to go to Ireland with her business school class for three weeks. I've never been anywhere that's not part of the United States, Canada, Mexico, or Puerto Rico. I mean, come on, man. I thought I was pretty, I thought I was pretty fancy having been to Puerto Rico. And uh, she got to go to Ireland. So yeah, I am not ashamed to say I was jealous. She's had some experiences and some opportunities that, that I never had. Um, part of it has to do with the world is different. Like taking a, a trip abroad when I was a student wasn't even, like that was for people who went to private schools. That wasn't for public 
college students. You know, it's like it didn't, it wasn't even an option. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, now I kind of get that a little bit more. Also, there's some jealousy that has to do with like their, the kids are in their like prime fitness and attractiveness. And, you know, I have to say, I was really jealous. I have curly hair and uh, they invented the best flat irons during my daughter's adolescence that they did not have when I was a kid. So I just had to deal with the fact that I had this, you know, just unruly curly hair and um, at a period of time when it wasn't fashionable. And um, and she got to have this awesome flat iron. I, I was jealous. <laughs> like, these are some pretty meaningful jealousy moments. But um, these are things that parents often struggle with. Their, their kids are having this opportunity to be adolescents and the parents are like, man, kind of remember being an adolescent you know I remember the good things I might remember the bad things you know about being an adolescent maybe I remember the bad things it seems like like my child is having better experiences you know seeing how young their kids are and fit and strong and other things makes the parents start to think man that was like 20 years ago for me oh 25 years ago for me oh geez I've got a lot of water under the bridge at this point. And that can be like this moment of sort of like, I don't have all that ahead of me that you have. Something that was a really popular topic in the 1960s and 70s was this notion that when the kids all left the house, mom would be plunged into a depression and she would be like, oh, I don't know what to do with my life anymore. And the kids were everything. And I, I think it won't shock you at all for me to tell you that is not how the research has panned out like modern moms don't experience that kind of bereft oh no the house is empty kind of moment usually it's very liberating especially for mothers who in the average family bear a lot of the brunt of child related stuff you know laundry to food prep to keeping track of dates and times and you know there's a lot of stuff that moms carry when you know there are kids in the house that once the kids are gone, they're liberated. In my in my family, my husband was the one who was liberated. But um, usually for moms, it can oftentimes be harder on the fathers who have been the breadwinners the whole time because oftentimes they'll say, man, they've actually left the house and I always planned on taking them, you know, fishing or I was always gonna, it's like a, it's a, like a, a chorus out of Cats in the Cradle uh, where when you come in home, dad, I don't know when, but we'll get together then, son. And it's like, kind of an actual feeling that some dads experience when they've worked really hard to support their family and, and did what they perceive to be um, their role. And then when the kids leave, they're kind of like, oh, I saw the cutest video on uh, on Instagram today where they said this, the, the parents of the little kid said this is my dad every time we come over with the baby he comes running out of the house and he was out having a walk and they pull into the driveway he comes running down the street to see the baby and uh it's adorable and i'll bet you anything he was probably an awesome dad anyway but i would just say that when he was raising his own kids he probably didn't have that time or that opportunity to be as available every single time that the baby he could have been and he's gonna now have that opportunity with his grandchild so it's like Sometimes you get a second chance, that's good news. And the best way to get to that point is, you know, to have an empty nest. So it can be really liberating, can be, you know, a sad time also. Um, other relationships, a lot of us, you know, through adulthood still have parents above us, right? Who are still, um, you know, vibrant or maybe starting to ha need some care. But for most adults, they report that their relationship with their parent is positive. Now. Not everybody. I mean, it can, parents can be difficult to get along with when you're an adolescent. They can continue to be difficult to get along with when you're 40, right? So it's not perfect. But um, on average, most adults report that they have a positive relationship with their parents. Um, when the parents are healthy and vigorous, it's much easier to have positive relationships with them because they are still able to be super autonomous and and things like that, it gets a little bit more complicated if the parents are starting to, to slow down or have health issues. 91% of respondents report that they're close to their mother and 87% report that they're close to their father. Um, now that's a little bit less with father, right? And it may have something to do with how um, on average, moms tend to do a lot of the up close parenting 
And so that causes the kids to have a little bit tighter bond with mom, especially in a most emotionally tight bond with their mom. Adults are often put into a position that we call the sandwich generation, where they are the adult and they've got kids who are dependent on them. And then they have elderly parents who are, who are needing care and needing support and things like that. And that can make this period of life really stressful. So when we saw that U-shaped curve of marital satisfaction, something we should probably throw in there to be contributing to that lowest level of satisfaction might be, you know, aging parents. That can be a source of tension in a marriage too. So these things that happen to us as individuals can have impacts on our other relationships, obviously. How about friends? Friends can be the most important part of our social convoy, especially friends that we've known a long time and have seen us across a lot of different circumstances and have, you know, I was going to say have been stably part of our lives, but I have to say some of my best in my late, you know, my middle adulthood years, um, some of my best relationships with my like old time friends have been the ones who I really seriously lost contact with. And then we've reunited and it feels like we haven't even like missed a step. So I'm not going to even say you have to maintain contact with them because I would say that raising kids can be a little stressful on friendships too. Um, you sort of, everybody withdraws, everybody's like so focused on just keeping their head above water in the household that, you know, a lot of times you don't have time for your friends. And so getting to get reunited can be a really, um, a great opportunity. Sometimes we have friends that are such close friends that they become what we call fictive kin these are like um, people friends who are just we've accepted them as part of our family we're as committed to them as we are to our cousins or our um, kids or how you know whatever you want to say they're part of our family um, having that level of commitment to somebody really provides a lot of security knowing that they're sort of your ride or die friend who would show up if you had a problem or you would do this the same um, gives that kind of security that, you know, even if something were to happen to, let's say, my romantic partner that I'm in a committed relationship with, I still have, you know, other, I still have a network. I have support. I have other people. The last issue we're going to address has to do with employment. And of course, this is the number one factor in adulthood. And I spent a lot of time talking about it in cognition. I just wanted a little bit, talk a little bit about parts of employment that can have an impact on your personal life or your relationships. Um, one thing that it has been really um, a hot topic since the 1980s, but really acutely since COVID is um, wages and benefits, right? Um, one of the things I, as an industrial and organizational psychologist myself, um, I've been really wondering why companies wouldn't use more time off, flex time, allowing people to telecommute and stuff than they do. A lot of companies go, oh no, it's impossible. We couldn't have our employees work from home. That It would be impossible. We'd lose the whole culture and it wouldn't work. Or we have too um, secure of stuff that we do at work. We couldn't possibly let them do it from their home computers or something like that. And then the pandemic hit and everybody had to do it. And then next thing you know, all of a sudden these companies are starting to go, you know what, this worked really well and it saved us a bunch of money having to rent out office space. And now we're starting to actually do some things that IO psychologists have been arguing for since the 1980s. Um, so we're going to see more and more opportunity for time off to have flex times to telecommute. Um, you know, most employees are experiencing more and more dissatisfaction with how much they make relative to the people who you know run the company or the or the organization and so um, these kinds of pressures are probably going to be causing some changes coming up in the future um, so i wanted to talk a little bit about income and happiness since i talked about uh, marriage and happiness let's talk a little bit about income and happiness and so in this chart, what we're seeing is uh, one measure of happiness called life evaluation. So like how satisfied are you with your life? And what you'll see is that um, in, the, in the women, which is red, and the blue, which is men, you see that there's not that much difference in how men and women are responding to this question. Um, they've got you know, high, medium, and low to give you sort of averages of, of across all people. What you're basically seeing is that once you get to about $80,000 of income at the time that they administered this test, um, 
the correlation between income and how satisfied you are with your life starts to taper off. You see it start to, to drop down. Um, so about 80,000. In this one, what we're seeing is how much positive affect they have, how much positive mood or emotion they have. And again, it starts to, you know, it looks like a pretty good correlation between income and um, you know, having positive affect up until you get to about 80,000 and then it starts to drop off again. And then when we look at mean negative affect, so this is how much you know they feel bad. And again, you're seeing a correlation that starts to drop off here at about 40. So about $40,000 and people start to feel less negative affect. Um, so there is some relationship between income and measures of happiness, but it's not completely linear. Like you wouldn't be happier and happier and happier the more and more and more you make. Once you get to a certain level, it seems to taper off. Now, one of the things employment does for us is it helps us to fulfill generativity needs from Erickson's model, right? Um, so we can use our personal skills. We can develop skills across our lifetime. Um, if we have creative energy, we have an opportunity to express it in the workplace. Oftentimes, um, we may be given opportunities to mentor coworkers. That's a very generative thing to be doing. Um, we can earn money to support the education of our offspring, to support the health of our family. That's a very generative thing to do. Um, and we can contribute to the community by providing goods and services that the community needs. So altogether, employment really does a lot of things for us that will help us to be able to fulfill what Erickson says we need to be doing. Now, when we work, there are two kinds of motivators, extrinsic motivators and intrinsic motivators. Extrinsic motivators are things like making a salary, having access to health insurance, having access to a pension once we retire. These are all things outside of ourselves that might motivate us to work. Intrinsic motivation would be factors inside of ourselves that drive us to work. And so uh, how satisfied we are with our jobs. You know, different people are satisfied with different jobs. So it's not how satisfying is the job, it's how satisfied you are with the job. That's an intrinsic motivator. How much self-esteem you have. Um, so if the work demands are matching your sense of self and, you know, whether you're fulfilling your sense of self, that's going to be a more satisfying job. Feeling pride in your job is going to be another intrinsic motivator. Feeling, you know, proud of where you work or what you do for a living will be another intrinsic motivator. So those are all factors that help, um, that I felt like were more social factors that help to determine, you know, a person's commitment to work and um, why people tend to fare well when they're working. All right, well, that completes adulthood. So I will see you in the next segment of life, which is old age. See you then.